Blog Talk Radio. One Child Abuse Survivor to Another Restoration. I'm glad to be here, and it's Monday night, July the 15th, 2019, um, Calgary, Alberta, same place, same same time. <laughs> glad to be able to do these shows, and hopefully you're doing well. Thanks, everybody, for tuning into my shows. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I don't have any idea who's tuning into the shows, and people from all over the world actually tune in. And uh, some, of, some of you I know are my friends, but I know there's a whole lot of other people out there that I have no idea who you are, and I just I appreciate it very much um, that you would spend this time with me. So this is uh, looking at some information. We're covering kind of boundary information, looking at boundaries and how to set boundaries for ourselves as survivors of abuse um, from Havoka. So we'll continue on with that article. And um, first we'll just do a safety check. If you're a survivor of abuse and you're not really – too far along in your healing journey and you're not safe enough you know you're not sure if you're really safe enough to be listening to anything like this sort of a you know information regarding abuse you want to be sure that you're safe enough to listen before you do because you don't want to go backward in your healing journey you know or or become distraught and like hurt yourself or hurt somebody else so you have to know how to keep yourself safe and i always say this on every show because you need to be careful um, and know whether you're safe enough to be listening. If you're not sure, just uh, get the information first. Turn the show off. Go get the information and, you know, come back another time, right? Or, you know, just make sure you keep yourself safe. You can get that information from uh, well, from Havoka. They have a safety first section. From NASCA, N-A-A-S-C-A, National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. That's who I volunteer with, with Bill Murray and crew. And there's the... Um, ASCA, I also volunteer there. That's Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and More Center Program. They have a Survivor to Thriver workbook, which is great. And you can download it for free or you can read it right online. And you can read the information on how to know whether you're safe enough and how to how to make sure that you're safe enough to be able to to do the healing work on your own or to listen to something like this, right? So be very careful. If you're anybody else and you're listening, you just have to listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse, a very sensitive, disturbing topic for most people. So you have to know what's good for you to listen to. Ultimately, you make that choice for yourself. And if you find that the topics of abuse or violence bother you, then just turn the show off because you won't be hurting my feelings at all. And we'll get right into it. <clears throat> so this week, you know, weekend, um, and it, actually the last part of last week, I was uh, doing a, sort of a search to see if I could find any posts from my brother or his wife um, because I hadn't really seen anything from him for a long time, and I was wondering if he was still alive or not, because he's getting up there in age. And uh, there was uh, an obituary. It was my brother's obituary, so he passed away in March of this year. So it was kind of sad news. I was like, well, that's really sad, because we had split off, oh, I don't even know how many years ago now, probably nine years ago I stopped talking to him. But he had cut me off before I cut him off. <laughs> the family all blames me, saying that I that I cut him off, but actually he cut me off before I cut him off. Um, I just did it as a, to make, you know, 
Sam cutting the whole family off, but he actually cut me off way before I cut him off. He was he was just his own person, you know. He was the oldest um, son in the family, and he wasn't the oldest child. My sister was the oldest, but he was next in line, and so he was the second oldest sibling. And um, he just, he left when I was born. So actually the year that I was born, probably before I was even born, he, he left. So he moved out when he was 16 hit the streets and because of the abuse in our home and the problems that he had, he had you know, he grew up abused himself. Um, he left when he was 16 and he just hit the road and he never came back. And he came back for a couple of visits, just a very short few visits. I don't remember him when I was little. I remember meeting him, <laughs> but I knew, I knew he was my brother cause they, you know, they told me he was, he was my brother, but, um, I used to hear about him, but I didn't know him at all. Um, you know, he was not around, as an adult, I finally got to kind of get to know him because I saw him a few times. He came down to visit down to New Mexico. He was living in Canada. And then and then when I moved up here, I got to see him for a bit and actually kind of started to get to know him. But we, because of the abuse, you know, he didn't really want anything to do with the family. And, you know, and, and all, I moved up to Canada. Then my other sister moved up to Canada. And my dad eventually ended up here. So he was just not happy about that. He was, He didn't, he moved he moved 2,000 miles away from, from his family to get away from all of that, right? And here we come trailing up here after him, right? So many years later, but still he was just like, oh, boy. So, um, you know, he wasn't thrilled with having me in his life, really. He didn't know me. He didn't feel like he needed to get to know me. And that's where I'm sad. I'm kind of like, well, that's a shame because I really wanted to get to know him. He's He was an interesting person. And um, so, yeah, um you know, he just passed on, and I have no idea how or anything. They, I knew they wouldn't tell me, and I'm kind of glad. I was hoping they wouldn't because I wouldn't have gone to his funeral anyway. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't go to my mom's funeral. He didn't go to my sister's funeral and in the States. And I don't I, – he probably went to my dad's funeral just because he probably felt like he should because because they're in the next – they lived in the next city – well, one of the next towns over. So – too close for comfort. I think he probably, he might have gone to my dad's funeral. I don't know, but all I know is none of us are close. It's such a dysfunctional family. There's hardly anybody left now. It's just me and my sister, right? So now I'll be searching her name out for, for obituaries. I'm sure she's doing the same for me too. And uh, because we don't talk, we're done. Like as a family, we were never a family, and um, it was never okay what went on there in that house. And I just was bold enough to speak up about it. And, they, you know, they wanted to just live in this quiet, let's pretend none of that really went on, you know, so that we don't have to deal with it. Whereas I was like, no, if I'm going to ever get any better and I'm going to heal, I'm going to have to deal with it. So that's exactly why I went public with my stuff. It was really a self-preservation. I was like, look, if I'm going to, like, actually get better and heal from this abuse that I suffered as a child, I'm going to have to deal with it, man. And it's going to be horrible, but I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to get help, right? Well, they didn't want to do that because they just want to pretend that that none of that happened and, you know, they just live in this denial, right? But sometimes people have to do that, right? That's just – sometimes that's just life for people, um, you know, who can't do the reality of the abuse, right? So it's real sad, and I'm sad that he's gone. I have no idea if he suffered. I just don't know. And – um all I know is that he was very interesting. Um, I always looked up to him. He tried to help my, or like his younger brothers, my older siblings. Um, two of my brothers, the one that actually raped me, Rob, who was a psychotic, mentally ill uh, drug user, heroin addict and everything else, cokehead. He was a big time drug user, but he was also mentally ill and very psychologically ill. But he tried to help him, you know, he tried to help him stay off the streets and stop doing drugs and they had no idea that he had raped me when I was eight years old, and uh, so they would have known that. They didn't find that out till till I went public with my stuff, and so I'm sure that they didn't believe it. But whatever, and uh, they weren't around, so they don't know. And my um, other brother Howard, who was also a big time drug user, and always on the streets, he tried to help him too. So, you know, Kevin, my brother that just passed away, he was a good guy actually in the family. I wouldn't say he was. He never did anything to me. He just made me angry as an adult because he kind of booted me out of his life and I was grumpy about it, but then I booted him out, so it was mutual. But, you know, I just kind of uh, always looked up to him because he he had to take the brunt of 
trying to help his brothers out who ended up ended up killing themselves, right? So he always felt like he he wasn't able to do enough to help them want to live, you know. And, and the, the issue was is that you couldn't do enough for those two. They were so screwed up. And the issue is, is we all grew up in the same house. So we are all really screwed up. And, you know, that's why I talk about this stuff. It was absolutely a horrific nightmare to grow up in that mess. And um, it's like people just think abuse is a joke. Like, can't they just get over it? No, the issue is, is no. No, they can't just get over it. We just can't just get over it. Or was it really that bad? These are the these are the types of things that people that have no idea what it's like to grow up in dysfunction, in um, a, an unstable, unhealthy, horrible, abusive environment, day after day, night after night, and it doesn't end, and it doesn't stop, and it doesn't get any better, right? And then have to try to navigate as an adult, right? And people just think it's a joke, you know. Like, can't they just move on and, you know, forgive and forget? <laughs> it's like, you know, no. <laughs> trauma is trauma, man. And we had our share of trauma, let me tell you. Trauma, trauma, trauma. Crisis after crisis. Our whole entire existence was crisis. So it's, you know, he did what he he did his, he did what he could. I think he was a good guy, and I, you know, I'm sad that he's gone. But he lived a pretty full life. I mean, he made it to 69 years old. He was 16 years older than me. So, you know, 69, that's pretty good. And uh, my sister, his, who you know, who's the oldest, she lived to be 60. She died of cancer. So we don't live very long. But, you know, you just you just go with the flow, do what you can. You know what I mean? Um, I knew he was suffering. He just, you know, my dad beat him. And my dad was his main abuser, I'm sure. My mom, too, a little bit. But. I think it was mainly for my dad when he was a little boy. My dad actually um, beat him over the head with a an, a heavy encyclopedia when he was like two, three years old. And I, I think he like damaged his brain because my brother never saw right after that. And uh, But he was very, I mean, he was highly intelligent, my brother. He was a pilot. He built airplanes. He used to design small aircraft, like small Cessnas and stuff like that. And he used to work with people like that. He was a, he was worked in construction, and he had his own style where he would build with no nails, uh, staircases and, and cupboards like the Europeans do. He was just really brilliant and very smart and also very funny and very witty, very funny person. He had a good sense of humor, and he was just fun to be around when he wasn't crabby. <laughs> when he was crabby, he was like no fun to be around, but... He was uh, he was a good guy, but he suffered. He did his share of suffering, but he really never talked about it. And he tried to make it look like it was just no big deal, you know. And I think that's just the only way he could deal with it. It's the only way he could. I guess that's the only way he could handle it, you know, was to, it's just to feel like that about it. But the issue is, is, is it's horrific what we went through. And so my heart really went out to him too. And you know, even though he didn't really want anything to do with him, I wanted to know my brother and it's unfortunate that that really didn't happen I could have had so many years to go and visit him and speak and spend time with him and talk to him and let him talk to me and get to know him and it didn't happen so that's too bad and um, you know what can you do just move on so I just wanted to just do talk a little bit about that but we'll move into this article this is boundary issues we're looking at the last section of this um, negotiation article that we're looking at from Havoka that's information for survivors, it's personal boundaries. And so that's what we're going to pick up with. So we'll just get started since we're kind of late for time here. I'm just reading from the page. It's a gentleman that wrote this. I have no idea the name of this person that wrote this article, but I'm just reading right from the page. And he it's pretty good. I actually find it quite interesting. He says, often it is little things that seem inconsequential that is that it is most important to set boundaries about irritating little habits or mannerisms of another person. The irritating little things will grow into huge monsters unless we learn to communicate and negotiate. When we stuff our feelings, we build up resentments, and resentments are victim feelings, the feeling that somebody is doing something to us. If we don't speak up and take the risk of sharing how we feel, we will end up blowing up and or being passive-aggressive and damaging the relationship. (laughs) Well, that's just true. 
Um, learning to set boundaries is a vital part of learning to communicate in a direct and honest manner. It is impossible to have a healthy relationship with someone who has no boundaries. With someone who cannot communicate directly and honestly, um, learning how to set boundaries is a necessary step in learning to be a friend to ourselves. It is our responsibility to take care of ourselves, to protect ourselves when it's necessary, and it is impossible to learn to be loving to ourselves without owning ourself and owning our rights and responsibilities as co-creators of our lives. And I think that's just so sums up this article quite well. And that's the last part of it. But it's it's so true. <clears throat> All of this stuff is very important, you know, to have a healthy relationship. So many people don't know how to do boundaries. They just have no idea. And then if, it, you know, and many times if, if a person is told, well, we need to set some boundaries because, you know, this is what I need. And you know, then they take offense to it as if they're perfect or something. That's how my sister is. You know, um, she's perfect. It's the whole world that's messed up, but she's perfect. She won't apologize for anything ever, even when she's totally screwed up and totally wrong in the whole situation. She will never apologize. She's like my dad. You know, she's never wrong. My mom was like that too. Never wrong. Oh no. Um, always somebody else, right? Whereas I just decided not to be like that. I'm like, no, if I screw up, i got to apologize. And I'm like, you know what? I need to be honest. I need to be responsible for my behavior. If I mess up, I need to apologize and make it right. Because that's what I wanted my parents to do. I wanted my mom to make it right. You know, I loved my parents. I didn't want to be removed from the home. And I didn't want them to go to jail. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, You know, that would have been a tragic for me. I wanted my parents to love me and to take care of me and to stop trying to kill each other. And to then to love us enough as their children to want to help us stay alive <laughs> instead of encouraging us to go out and kill ourselves. Um, you know, it's just little stuff, right? That just seems so stupid. But it's that's what I wanted for them to be, to take responsibility and own up. And I really tried to get my mom to do that because that, I didn't care so much about my dad because he was evil and psychotic at the same time. So I didn't, you know, I was like, whatever. But my mom, I really loved her. And, you know, I knew she was a victim herself. You know, she was a survivor of abuse, horrific child abuse, as well as then married to my dad. And I thought, good Lord, that would drive anybody crazy. You know what I mean? It's no wonder. I, I used to kind of excuse her behavior away a little bit when I was growing up because it was like I could see what my dad was doing to her. And I could see how bad her nerves were. And so I, I could kind of understand why she treated me the way she did. I could never – I mean, I, I can't quite fathom her getting – um, so highly volatile with me, but I can see how it could push somebody over the edge to be crazy <clears throat> because my dad was absolutely insane. And so I kind of didn't care about him so much, you know, I was like, whatever. But my mom, I really felt sorry for her in a way. And, you know, thought, you know, her, she would have been a totally different person if she had been married to somebody else. I'm sure of it. So I felt a little bit bad for her. But the thing is, is, you know, you make your choices and then you have to deal with it. It, You know, she could have got help. That's where I'm like, you know, you have to own up and take responsibility for yourself. And you have to take responsibility for your life and those around you. See, I don't have, there's nobody in my life relying on me except for my cat. I don't have children to worry about because I was raped as a child and I can't have children, right? I couldn't have children. And I couldn't adopt, you know, it's like, no, no. And then my husband got ter diagnosed terminally ill you know, life for me was just, okay, no, we're not having, I mean, no, children are not the picture. But I've got a cat who's relying on me, and I mean, I want to stay alive and, and, and look after my cat. I Really, I spoil that cat. That cat's my baby, right? And um, I love that cat. She's wonderful. But the thing is, is um, it's not so much of an issue for me what I do with myself. It's my choice. I live my life the way that I do as long as I'm not hurting people around me. I should have the right to make my own decisions on how I'm going to live my life. Truthfully, if I'm not hurting anybody, I can eat pizza every night of the week if I want to and sit around and I don't have to do anything if I don't want to because nobody's really relying on me. Um, but when you have like a whole brood of seven children, you know, and you need to make the right choices, right? And my parents really, they showed us how much they didn't care by not making those choices that they needed to make, especially when when uh, the child protective child protective services got involved, and my parents were busted and arrested on child abuse charges, both of them, and they were they had at that opportunity 
should have split. They should have split up, and they should, whether they divorced or whatever. But they didn't want to do that. <clears throat> no, they just wanted to continue living this insane, absolutely crazy lifestyle. And it's like, you know, they just didn't think it out. And so as an adult, I see what they did, and I'm, like, trying to learn from that. If we're, like, like th- what this guy is saying here is just so important. Like, if, if we don't take care of things in our relationships with people, they we end up, we, we, we either blow up and become aggressive ourselves, you know, or become irate or whatever it is and ruin the relationship that way, or we become passive aggressive, you know, and then damage the relationship that way. And so my sister's passive aggressive. I'm the blow up, you know, I'm the one that waits until my, until the the exceeded levels, the stress levels, I just can't deal with it anymore and I blow up. My sister's passive aggressive. So that's, you know, that's just people just handle things differently, right? And, um, you know, for me, I'll just take it and take it and take it until the one day I'm like, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to explode or I'm going to leave because I don't want to hurt somebody. Generally, that's what it is. But uh, I'm serious because I don't want to be my parents, you know what I mean? Um, it's it, We have to learn how to do this stuff. There's This next section of this article is really interesting because it actually talks about it. If you go to Havoka, www.havocahavoka.org, under their survivors tab, under the personal boundaries tab, go to negotiation, and then next. And that actually really sort of spells it out how to do it, how to do these things and for ourselves. Because like you say, if we're going to ever learn to be a friend to ourselves, you know, we need to set boundaries. We need to learn how to set boundaries. Because we need to make sure that we, as a co-creator of our, of our lives, that we're owning our rights and responsibilities, you know, and taking ownership and taking the responsibility on to do the right things for ourselves and then to do the right things for other people. You know, if everybody was doing that, there wouldn't be abuse. But no, that's the thing. People don't want to do that. They don't want to take care of themselves, and they also don't want to take care of somebody else. They just want to be able to just do whatever they want, and it doesn't matter if they hurt somebody, and they're never going to apologize, <laughs> and they're never going to change. That's abuse. That's what that's that's abuse and um, irresponsibility, right? That's basically what that is. So it's kind of like, well, you know, coming from abuse and growing up in abuse because I didn't ever have a normal day. Um, apart from the abuse, you know what I mean, except for when I was sleeping over at a friend's house, you know what I mean, or something like that, or crashing on somebody's couch, and I might have experienced a good day at that point. But if I was in the house with my parents, which was year after year after year after year, I was part of their game, their crazy, insane, drama crisis, trauma-filled, evil game that they played. And it was, you know, that's how they lived their lives. And it's like, so then me as an adult coming out of that, I realized how screwed up I was, but I used to watch Little House on the Prairie a lot, so I got a lot of good advice from Little House on the Prairie on how to be nice to people and what it is to like be loving and kind, and, and I had some good friends, you know, that would help me out, that helped me out along the way, that made a big difference, and so, you know, I've come, I wanted to be good to people, and I want people to be good to me, so, you know, I have to learn how to stand up for myself. I have to learn how to to state my needs. And I still have issues with that today. Because I feel like, well, I feel like if I do state my needs, it's going to cause problems. Because it does. Most people don't care. And that's a fact. Even people that you think care, you know, will cringe if you start stating your needs. Because they're like, oh, you know. Nope. Uh, people just don't want to take responsibility for their behavior really is what it is. It's unfortunate, but true. So this next section that we're going to look at, that's help sheet, we'll look at um, next week. And how many minutes do we have left here? Oh, about five minutes. So let's see. We'll move on from here. This is a lengthy article. If you go and check that out, it's quite lengthy. That'll be a couple of shows worth probably just to get through that, maybe two or three. And then we'll be done with that section. So how about let's look at some positive reinforcement. What are we doing right in our daily walk? Like our, you know, how are we doing looking at positives and progress instead of just negatives, right? Um, well, positive reinforcement, I don't know. I would say I have to think of the fact that I'm just continuing on, you know, trying to trying to take care of myself the best that I can. I'm really not into 
physical health care, you know what I mean? Um, I have been in the doctor's office for other people my whole life, you know. My mom, when I was younger, Cecil now as an adult, and I'm like, you know what, I'm I'm so done with that. Like, I don't want to spend my whole life in the damn doctor's office, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Even if it's not, for, if it's for me, I don't care, you know what I mean? And people would say, well, you have to care, and it's like, no, because are you like do you really want to live long enough that somebody's going to be you know wiping your butt as you're laying in bed you know it's like no you know what i mean like for me that's not what i want i'm not looking for longevity i really don't care what i want is peace peace in my heart peace in my mind peace in my life that's what i've got because i don't have a lot of people pushing and prodding and digging into my cavities and you know i was abused as a child like sexually physically I don't want people touching me in the first place unless I say it's okay you know what I mean I don't want that control taken away from me so I don't want some doctor digging around you know what I mean it's like I've already had all of the checkups I'm an older older lady you know in a few years I'm going to hit 60 so it's like you know really five years goes fast and I mean two or three after that I'm 60 right I don't even know if I'm going to live to be 60 I don't care you know what I mean but that doesn't mean that I don't try to get enough sleep because I do. I always try to get enough sleep. I drink a, I drink plenty of water during the day. Um, I eat healthy. I'm a little bit overweight because I just don't do in, uh, any activity and I kind of eat a little bit too much. So, you know, I'm a little chubby, kind of chunky, but I'm not too obese. I wouldn't even say that I'm nearly obese. I'm not obese at all. I'm just a little kind of, you know, heavy around the middle because I don't do anything, right? But uh, I eat healthy and I'm, you know... I kind of do that sort of stuff. So I don't really feel the need to be running to the doctor all the time. You know what I mean? Um, I'm happy not going to the doctor. It makes me happy to not go. What what brings me and causes me distress is having to go to the doctor. So why would I, I don't want to do that for myself. You know what I mean? So I'm not talking about that kind of stuff as far as um, becoming a health nut. I'm not into health whatsoever. I'm into my spiritual spiritual health that's what's more interesting to me because i'm going to live on for eternity here so i want to make sure i'm in the, the proper spiritual um frame when i leave you know what i mean and that's my main goal um but you know everybody's different and like i said i don't have anybody that's relying on me to be here like if i had children or grandchildren or something it's a little different story right it's just me when I go I'm gonna to have to hire somebody to like do my funeral I don't even want a funeral like whatever nobody would show up I'm talking about like my cremation for my remains somebody's gonna have to hire like pay for somebody to do this for me because there's gonna be nobody to take care of me the government's gonna to have to do it right um I'm on my own I'm by myself you know and the, the issue is I mean I've got some friends but I can't expect them to do that for me <laughs> I wouldn't expect them to do that for me. So the issue is, is I'm by, I'm actually on my own, and so I can do whatever I want. You know what I mean? The I could I could just go off into oblivion and whatever, do drugs and drink alcohol and all that. But instead of that, I'm doing it straight. You know, the only thing that I do do is I smoke cigarettes, whatever. I'm working on trying to switch to the vape now, but I try to take care of myself in that respect because I want to continue on as long as my body's going to go. And then when it drops, I'm going to go off into eternity and be happy, you know. And I've got peace in my heart now because my abusers are dead and I've made peace with myself. I know that I was none of those things that they said I was. I know that I didn't deserve that abuse. I never did. Nobody ever does. You know, I care about myself enough to know that, I, that, I, that I'm a good person and I never should have been treated that way ever by anybody and that I can be a good person to people. And I then expect them to be good to me in return. I don't allow people to mis mistreat me or misuse me in whatsoever. I stand up for myself. I'm an incredibly strong person. And I'm going to leave this earth on my own terms. Like when I go, I go. Um, and I'm doing a pretty good job to take care of myself. I'm more interested in kind of helping other people than I am trying to figure out how I'm going to, you know, whatever, manage for the next 15 years. Like, I may not be here, right? So my thing is kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, week-to-week. -week. I don't worry about too much about longevity, right? Um, but that's just me. I don't have anybody relying on me. I think it's, it is totally different if you have children and grandchildren and stuff like that. You need to be around for them, right? 
for me, I'm kind of like, well, it's just me, and so whatever, and my cat, right? So, and I do try to take really good care of her. She's really sweet, and um, but we'll pick up the rest of this article next next week, next time. In the meantime, I've got about I don't know, ten seconds. That's it. So, you guys, it didn't give me the warning that I was done. So I'm not sure if it's even streaming. So hopefully you guys have a great night. Take care of yourselves. You know, like I say on all my shows, if you're struggling and you can't cope, you call a crisis line, you call somebody, but make sure you reach out and you get some help, right? Because there's people out there that do care. Believe it or not, there are. And you just have to reach out and you have to find them. And then if you don't find somebody that you find that really, that doesn't, you know, that does care, you know, if you find one, you keep them. But if you don't, you keep looking till you do, right? Make those phone calls, but you get help, no matter what it is. Get help. You know, don't don't give up. That's my main message. So we'll talk to you next week, and you take care of yourselves. Bye bye. <laughs>